Welcome to Monday Live, Exploring Birth Psychology. Today is Monday, September 13th, 2021. I'm your host, Katherine Lightfoot, the Education Director for APA, the Association for Prenatal and Perinatal Psychology and Health. Monday Live is APA's platform for bringing you the experts and pioneers in the field of pre and perinatal psychology that inform and inspire our expanding awareness of conscious babies. The recordings from each Monday Live are available in our Monday Live library as a membership benefit for APA Premier members. To all of our members, we give you a big warm hug of gratitude today. Thank you. This week and next week, our Monday Live guest speakers are focused on fatherhood this week and motherhood next week. Although some people find comfort in the use of the more traditional words father and mother, we want to acknowledge that for some they may cause discomfort. APA recognizes that all, not all birthing people and parents identify as mothers or fathers, and it's our intention to be inclusive of all genders, non-binary and other gendered pregnant and birthing people and their partners. We are actively seeking speakers who can give voice to the experience of parenting in the non-traditional gender role. So please let us know if you have any speaker suggestions for us. My email is edu at birthpsychology.com. So I'd love to um, share my screen with you all real quick and just make sure you're aware of a wonderful live workshop that's coming up this or next weekend. Weaving Cranial Sacral Therapy and Birth Psychology with Carol McClellan. You're, there's still time to snag your seat for this wonderful workshop and I wanted to give you a little preview of what you can expect there for those two days. It's a Saturday and Sunday, 12, to three Eastern time frame. And here's some of the things that you're going to get to experience with Carol, the history of cranial psychotherapy, uh, cranial psychotherapy for conception, pregnancy and birth. And then she weaves in the birth psychology concepts. So understanding of boundaries and neutrality, cranial sacral anatomy, lots of palpating and lectures and demos and practices. So please feel free to join us there um, and snag your spot. The best place to go to find the place to register is birthpsychology.com slash events. You'll see it there as one of the featured courses on our event page. So as we begin today, let us just take a moment to resource ourselves. One simple way to do this is to find something in your space that is beautiful or grounding or helps bring you a pause and you can just glance at that item. Take a breath with that object or out the window. And breathe in a sense of calm, sliding gently back to center, to earth, calm openness. And we gently bring our awareness back to the screen whenever ready. Our guest speaker today is Patrick Hauser. Patrick is a father and a grandfather, and the water birth of his second son in 1980 was the result of his three-year inquiry into birth and birth psychology that was stimulated by his first son's traumatic arrival. Realizing that there's a connection between who we are, how we get this way, and how to give birth and receive our children consciously, Patrick began Fathers to Be, an initiative supporting education, understanding, and engagement in fatherhood and family. They provided classes and coaching for expectant and new partners and consulted with health service providers toward their better understanding and more successful support of fathers and partners in various programs. Patrick has also run workshops for birth professionals and parents in many countries. We're so glad you're here, Patrick. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so pleased. APA is just at the foundation of everything I do in this field. It just has, you know, the heart and soul that matches with why I'm here. So I'm, I'm really, really pleased that uh, to have been contacted and to be, have this opportunity today. Uh, 
just a second. There we go. Is that good, Catherine? That's great. We see it perfectly. Okay, okay good. So yes, welcome. I, I find that to be the most significant and supportive word for expectant dads. I, one of the first uh, events that my colleague Elmer Postel and I did when we started this project was for a group of midwives in London. <clears throat> and at the end, one of them, one of them said, what? give me the nub, give me the, give me the essence, give me the, you know, what's the most important thing and just what came out was welcome. If a dad knows that he's welcome, I mean, you arrive at somebody's house and you don't get a welcome, you don't feel welcome, what's that like? You don't really want to go through the threshold, do you? <laughs> so for a dad, an expectant dad coming into a room, uh, welcome is just huge. It's so important. So I just, I just love that word. So it is welcome. And so you all are welcome here today. And the tagline fathers make the world of difference is, is so true. And I just, that's what I, I live by in this work um, because they do. So let's explore a little and see just what that means. So fathers to be is an international initiative for the support of the family during the primary time. And as I'm sure all of you know, the primary time is, you know, from conception through the child's first or second birthday. And in, in England, they, they have an initiative called a thousand and one days. And that's what they encapsulate uh, that into the thousand and one days is that primary time, the primal time. And I approach this from a, a mind, body, spirit. It, it's who we are and, and encompassing all of these parts. And if you leave out one part, the other parts are gonna suffer and we won't be whole. And so wholeness of course is, is the objective. And the perspectives are, the sociology, the psychology, and spirituality. Sociology is that which makes us up in our environment and our culture, which then results in the psychology. And that sociology could be the parents, the schools, the religions, the, you know, whatever all of that is, then builds to create the psychology of who we become and how we act and who we are in life. And then spirituality is, is the essence of us, not religious, it's just our essence in how we express and how we experience life and love. So with what we now know from science, psychology, and our own hearts, we have an unprecedented opportunity to nurture our children's lifelong well-being. For the majority of mothers today, an important ingredient for her uh, well-being, oh, <laughs> for the pregnancy, birth, and breastfeeding is the care provided by the father or the partner. Fathers are having a less physical and therefore a less visible experience than mothers, and yet they are having one. And research shows that fathers are more open during pregnancy, and this provides an opportunity for connection with them in childbirth preparation classes and one-on-one -on -one contact. Fathers are a resource that has been underutilized. Professionals have an opportunity, an important role to play in welcoming fathers into pregnancy, birth, and breastfeeding. And that's, that's all a capsule that just, to me, comes under the heading of birth. All of those elements, that's just with a capital B. You know, that's, that's the process we're engaged in during this primal time. This is Marie Mongan, the founder of Hypnobirthing, which she is no longer with us, but her work goes on. And she was just a giant in the field of conscious birthing practices. And this quote of hers, I just love for several reasons. The knowledge that she is supported by a caring and loving companion is one of the most important factors in maintaining the emotional well-being of a pregnant mother and the baby she is carrying. So two really important things here is the knowledge that she is supported. That doesn't even say anybody's doing anything at this moment. It's just that knowledge that she holds in her heart that she's being supported is huge towards her maintaining this well-being. And the other is uh, the emotional well-being of the mother and the baby she is carrying, which is of course the nub of APA. It's like the baby, everything the mother experiences, the baby gets a dose of, good, bad, or indifferent. So when I started this project with my colleague Elmer Postel back in uh, 2006, we were on a retreat 
And in the morning circle, um, there was a, a man that had become a friend of mine and he was a new dad, Elmer Postal, sitting across the, from me in this morning circle. And he said, it, and he, he's a new dad and I'm a grandfather, right? And so across from the circle, he says, well, you know, someday I'd like to, you know, work with expectant dads because I have found it such a fascinating process. And so it, part of his personal development, he brought into, you know, his being a dad. And when he said that, it's like every cell in my body woke up. You know, I was like, boom. It's like I was struck by lightning. And as soon as the meeting was over, I went over, I grabbed him by the collar. And I said, Elmer, we have to do this. We have to go out and do this. So when we came back from the retreat and I came home and I fired up my computer, it had been maybe 10 days since I'd been on a computer. And I go, okay, Google knows everything. Google knows all. And to really get to the nub, you put it in quotes. So I put fathers to be in quotes. This is 2006. What did Google, now Google can't lie, right? Google can only tell the truth. Google only knows what the facts are in the digital world and, and what's going on out there. Google came back and said, did you mean mothers to be? No reference found. Now this is our, has been our cultural phrase for expectant dads forever. There was no reference on the entire World Wide Web. Well, I, was, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Honestly, I was befuddled. It was just amazing that this could be the response from Google, you know, the oracle of our time. You know, here, it was just amazing. So where were the expectant dads? Well, they were either in a black hole someplace, which we know actually that they weren't, but where were they? What, what was the deal here? Well, I started doing research. I, I, you know, I got online and I went to here and I went to there and I went to there and there, all around. Pregnancy and childbirth education organizations, government policies, health services, midwifery programs and websites, hospitals, doula, doula organizations, all of them, they were all using euphemisms. They were using partner, birth part, and rest of the family and other family members. While that appears to be inclusive, and in a way it is, what the fact is, is research shows that unless the word father or dad is used, a man will tend to not include himself. If your name is Sally and I call you Jane, you're not going to turn around and say yes. You know, so, I, you know, they're more than a birth partner. You know, they are way, way, way more than that. And so it's important to include, include that word. So go ahead and use the F word. <laughs> so if we want to embrace everyone, the most inclusive words to use are father slash partner or father slash birth partner. That we've, we've, we've got to be conscious of our language and how it affects once it leaves our mouth, you know, what influence it has on our target, if you will. And whether that's, you know, in a classroom or at the grocery store or the gas station or talking to your partner, you know, whatever it is, we need to be inclusive. And, and it's a huge opportunity. So go ahead and use the word father. Think it, speak it, write it, parents, professionals, educators, and our children are listening. Our children from in utero throughout, our children are listening. Are we speaking in a way that's inclusive and, and direct and honest and meaningful because they are listening. In a pre-verbal state, they are listening. In the womb, they are listening. And that's just really important to understand, which most of us do, but by bringing it forward with the father word, then we can better support the father. And this is part of him feeling welcome too. If we use his, his cultural name, then he'll go, oh yeah, that's me, that's me. In 1975, your typical father spent 15 minutes a day with his children. By 1997, it was two hours. By 2009, it was five hours, averaged out over a week. Well, over 90% of fathers are present at the birth of their children in the West. Is it a coincidence or a clue that the same time period where fathers were invited into the birthing room is the same time period where their engagement with the family goes way up. I don't think it's a coincidence. And it's, it's, it's a meaningful clue as to how we become a more inclusive culture and how we um, 
make it possible for, for humanity to evolve in a way that's, that's more balanced. And so this is just unprecedented in human behavior to have this dramatic a shift in a, in a culture over a very short period of time. So I like the, you know, since birth is such femininity and birth is such a feminine, you know, it's water, it's, it's waves, it's tides, you know, so father's learning to ride the waves, of pregnancy, birth and breastfeeding. Now, of course, if he hasn't been included, if he doesn't feel welcome, what's going to happen? He's going to fall off the surfboard, right? He's going to get slammed into the sand. But if we properly help them prepare and understand and know what's going and what to do and what not to do, then we have a better opportunity for him riding that wave in a, in a peaceful and caring manner. So what is one important key for supporting dads? Empathy. <clears throat> we all know the word empathy and it, you know, it's, it's the use of the heart, it's understanding, it's, it's being connected with another person and having a sense of what their world is like. So what I'd like to do is take you on a short journey, if you're willing, um, which just involves closing your eyes, relaxing, take a few breaths, maybe go to that ideal place of relaxation for you. Maybe it's in your house, maybe it's next to a stream or in the mountains. Just, just completely relax and be willing to let your imagination go. So from this relaxed state, <clears throat> imagine that you're a man. You're, if you're currently a woman, just imagine that you're a man. How does that feel in your body? It's, do you feel just a little bit different? Let yourself settle in your chair and just imagine you're a man. And you're in a loving relationship. You've got a sweetheart, a wonderful woman, and she comes to you one day and says, my dear, we're going to have a baby. I'm pregnant. How does that feel? You're a man and your partner has just come to say, you're gonna be a father. How does that feel? And what do you think? Both of those are relevant issues. So how does the conversation change? What is the relationship like now? All of a sudden, boom, you're expecting a baby. So just kind of notice your relationship with this woman and time starts to pass a couple of weeks, a month maybe, and conversations have changed and you're looking forward a little different in your life than you were the day before. You know, what's, what's different? What's, what's new with you? What's gonna change in your life? How, how is this journey of becoming a father going to be for you? And so it's progressed now in three months maybe, and she's starting to get a little tummy and, you know, intimacy has maybe changed, maybe not, but it's a different level for sure because this parenting thing creates new dynamics. And so just be with your partner, be loving and caring and, and speak about, you know, how it is for you. What are you thinking and what are you feeling as this journey progresses? Four months, five months, six months. Wow, you're really into it now. You're, you're, she's obviously pregnant and y'all are definitely gonna have a baby here. Fascinating. What's happened in your home? Have things rearranged? Have you moved? What's the latest in your relationship? How are you getting on? What's this like for you as a man being in a relationship with a woman who's pregnant? And by the way, the minute she conceived, you became a father. It doesn't happen at the birth. It happens the moment of conception. So embrace it. So time marches on. Trustfully, you're going to take a, a class, do some reading, educate yourself, get informed about this very feminine process called birth. You're entering a world where you've never gone before, most than likely. The vast majority of people, uh, of men, have never seen a birth. And they've only been to one, which was their own. You know, so um, this is a very interesting time. And so hopefully you've educated yourself some and you're moving along. And so nine months comes up and then all of a sudden she, one day she goes into labor. 
<clears throat> uh, most births are in, in hospitals these days, the vast majority. So let's just assume you're going to a hospital. When was the last time you were in a hospital? And what was it for? You know, it may have, you have, maybe you haven't been in a hospital since the day you were born. But regardless, you're in this very foreign place with total strangers. You may not know a single person there until perhaps you, you get to the midwife or the doctor. And so you're checked into a room, trustfully you're setting it up, getting ready for the birth. How's the connection with your partner? How is it going? How are you feeling? How are, are you feeling prepared? Do you think you know what to do and what not to do? Interesting assignment, huh? And so she's full on in labor. There's now nurses and doctors or midwives around. You're progressing in the process and pretty soon here comes the baby and the baby comes out and this woman that you adore and have cared for is all of a sudden holding the result of your love. She's holding this new baby and how do you feel? What's that like for you? And then you get to hold your child. What's that like? Trustfully, without a shirt, against your skin, what's that like for you, bonding with your new baby? So this is quite, a, quite an emotional time, no doubt. And trustfully, very soon, you're headed home, you and your new family. And home looks different for some reason, feels different for some reason. There's three of you instead of two of you. And then there's breastfeeding. Here's this baby breastfeeding. What's that like for you as a man watching the woman you love and have cared for for quite a long time? She's sharing her breasts with another human being, which is of course the ultimate purpose of them. However, up until now, they've had a different purpose in your world. What's that like for you? Be kind and gentle on yourself. Take a deep breath when you're ready. Come back to that place of relaxation where we started. Take a couple of deep breaths and open your eyes and rejoin the presentation as you wish. Empathy. There's no replacement for it. <clears throat> So also at birth, we have a great paradox. Typically in our culture, in our society, the man is doing the work. He's the big guy, the strong guy, he's sweating, he's doing the work. And the woman is perhaps doing the more gentle things, more creative things in, in that sense. Well, at birth, we have a role reversal on one level. The woman is doing the big work. She is doing it, she is physical, emotional, she's fully engaged, she's doing it. What's the guy's job? <laughs> the way I put it is do nothing but do it really, really well. <laughs> and so he's all of a sudden in this role of being a supporter, of being the gentle, caring and supportive one. Kind of a bit of a role reversal here. And if the important thing here is if nobody told him in advance that this this situation at slash opportunity is here, then he doesn't know this, this can hit him like a ton of bricks that all of a sudden, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be the, the big guy doing the work. And then all of a sudden, no, I'm not supposed to do that at all. You know? So all of these little key points that I'm going to go through here, they all come back to how can we support the dad? How can we support the new family? How can we get to this place of understanding where the father can get more engaged, the father can feel safe, the father can feel welcome and included. So <clears throat> these I call the four biggies, men. They understand pain from hitting their thumb with a hammer, from falling off a bike, from doing sports and getting slammed doing sports. That's how a man relates to pain. That's how he understands pain well. During birth, if a woman is experiencing pain, and not all of them do, many of them experience pleasure during birth, but if she is experiencing pain, the thing he needs to know, the thing we need to tell him 
as that that pain is creative. That pain is not causing damage or injury. That pain is purposeful and it's not a problem, it's not bad. But if he holds it in the context of how he understands pain, then he's gonna be really worried. And, you know, and he's gonna be putting out angst. He's gonna have fear about this thing called pain. Fear not, it's all fine. And then time. Well, how much time is the birth gonna take? Well, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> you know, the birth takes however long it takes. It's not something that works by the clock. It's, it's very, very, very organic. And it just, it just takes how it takes. So if he knows that he doesn't need a watch, he doesn't need his phone to keep track of time, he just engages in the process wholeheartedly and breathes and lets time go by as needed by the mother in her process, the mother and baby. Noise, well, he may hear his lover make noises he's never heard before. You know, if she's really engaged, she makes some very tribal, very earthy noises, so very primal noises. If he's never been alerted to that possibility, he may be thinking, whoa, something horrible is going on here. When in fact, it's wonderful because she's in her primal self and she's using that noise to support that process. So give him a clue. N noise from her is just fine. <laughs> And the other is safety. Is she going to be safe? Is she safe? Is my baby going to be safe? Well, the vast majority of births are safe. Uh, and they're safer typically without interventions. So don't be in too much of a hurry to invite, oh, I'm uncomfortable. So I think she should have some drugs. No, no, no. <laughs> She's not responsible for your comfort. You are. And if you're not comfortable, then deal with it. But she is going to be safe. She's engaged in this process and you need to support the natural order of the process, not something from another place inside of you. And trustfully, you know, the man has looked at these in advance some and, and understands this and goes, OK, so I'm me and her, she is her and she's doing the baby. So. So typically men will father the way they were fathered. That's their training, right? All, it's all about education. Education from the moment of conception, and some say even before, through, throughout all of life. It's all education, education, education. You could, you could take you know, babies of four different religions or cultures in a hospital and switch them and send them home with different parents. And guess what? Those babies will have a whole different set of training than the one from the culture or the religion of their original parent. So it's all about training, conditioning, education. And men will tend to think what society expects of them. And men are less likely than women to share their needs, even if they are aware of them. And men tend to have a less developed emotional vocabulary than women. Men are having an experience. It's just oftentimes they haven't had the training or the opportunity, their encouragement to dig in there and share it and be honest with themselves and who's ever in front of them with exactly how they're feeling and then have the words put to it so they can integrate it. <clears throat> this is my water baby, Jeremy, born in 1980, the first documented water birth in the US. And uh, those are my hands received into my hands. And so parents have a significant influence over their child's development from preconception onward. And the preconception is if, if expectant, if wannabe parents actually go through a process before they ever conceive of, you know, dealing with their inner world, dealing with fears about life and fears from their own background and perhaps even residuals from their own birth, then they can clear the way for this birth that's going to be before them when they do conceive a child. And that's really important. All prenatal, prenatal education needs to inform, inform both expectant parents how their thoughts and emotions have a profound impact on their baby and his her well-being and future potential. Pregnancy is a time of heightened awareness and sensitivity. An expectant mother must take special care to nourish her inner self as well as her body and fathers can help and have a big role in that. 
Virtually every element of a baby's life in utero is under the influence of a mother's physical and emotional environment and fathers too. One way to think about parents <clears throat> and the development of their unborn child is in terms of conscious co-creation or design. Architecture and design. Well, over time as a culture, we have used our intelligence and our wisdom to create amazing structures on this planet. The Taj Mahal, the Sydney Opera House, the Great Pyramids, the Chrysler Building in New York. What did it take to create these buildings? My God, years of planning, lots of materials, lots of intention around the process of designing and creating and bringing forth these, these magnificent creations. So if we take that idea and we say, well, what about future potential for the family and supply and could lie with architecture and design? that parents are actually the architects of the future. And this is not a messing with the genes kind of thing. <laughs> this is not designer babies. Oh no, this is about consciousness, awareness and support. So we had this tremendous opportunity to literally create our future because we are creating our future every moment. I don't care, good, bad or indifferent, it's constantly being creative. There is no doubt about it. However, is it conscious creation? Is it a creation that comes from love and caring and support? Or is it like, eh, you know, whoops, most, the vast majority of births are not conscious of, not births, of conceptions. They happen. So I submit that you can have, you know, one architecture, you can have another architecture, you know, it depends on your intention. Um, and I think we have an opportunity that we can seize to really, really, really change the culture of the world. I mean, violence begets violence, you know, love begets love. That's just how it works. <clears throat> so when it comes to the birth, she's having a baby, right? So what am I supposed to be doing? <laughs> and, and, you know, if we leave him to his own devices, if we don't help him prepare, understand, gain knowledge, wisdom, then what's, what's he got left? A wish and a prayer, right? And I think that's a, a sad state of affairs to, to leave a man or a birth partner in this place of really not having a clue. And that's how many, 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 many parents, fathers, birth partners have entered the arena is with a wish and a prayer. And that's a handicapped place to be. You know, it doesn't really do service to what's possible. <clears throat> many fathers go to childbirth classes just to support the mother. They typically do not have a clue. They are going to have an experience themselves, which needs to be supported. Fathers could do with their own support during birth, a male friend standing by, just on the other end of the phone or outside the room, you know, that sort of a thing. So they really know they've got a hand at their back. Because when you're the only man in the room, you know, and all this stuff is going on, which you've never seen, you don't have a clue about, then it, it can be tough. And um, I boil things down to, I'm, <laughs> an old girlfriend of mine used to call me uh, on, on a couple of occasions, and she said it with love, call me a simpleton, because I look at things very simply. She was Italian, so everything was complicated. There's love and there's fear. Everything boils down as far as I'm concerned, all actions, all intentions, all creations, there's love and there's fear. Well, so if we have a guy in a birthing room and he's working his phone, you know, he's playing a game, he's watching sports, he's doing all that, he's passing out. What's all, that's on the fear side of the column. The love side of the column is being present no matter what. Now, if he's got to go out and call a friend to get a little courage to, to clear something that's going on, that's great. But if he's ignoring the process or, or has his own stuff coming up, so to speak, then he needs support of a different kind and, and that needs to be recognized and dealt with. And also after the birth, fathers, mothers, supporters at a birthing room, everybody needs to debrief. It could be the most beautiful, holy birth that's ever happened. Debriefing is still important. It's important to go through the process and reflect on how it was for you. And then what do you take away from that? 
Humanity cannot invent a drug that can work better than a mother's body can manufacture, nor a knife that is sharper than her instinctual nature. When I was writing my book in 2006, um, I uh, know, sent Thomas Verney, uh, who we all know, uh, an email and said, hey, Thomas, I uh, started Father's Initiative and I'm working on a Father's to be handbook. And he emailed back and said, wow, that's fabulous. I am so glad I was waiting for somebody to do it. He says, I've got my hands full. Thank goodness you're doing it. And our next Congress is in two years. Would you please come present? And I was like, whoa, <laughs> okay. I got two years to prepare for this. And so the next morning, my writing time was 4 a.m. I would just wake up spontaneously, go to the living room, which faces the east and, use, the east, and use my laptop. I was living in England at the time. And so what came out that next morning, this was a piece of what came out that next morning. It's the thing called protecting the cave. It's like, what, the father's either in nine months, he's either got to become an obstetrician or he's got to learn where his center is and how to, how to stay there. And so uh, this came out that next morning, this little section that's in my book called Protecting the Cave, because the cave isn't a cave anymore, but there's still a cave that needs protecting. And so his understanding of that and how to apply it in a modern world is, is a really important thing. So the science of father love and the biology of the new family, within 15 minutes of holding a baby, men tend to experience raised levels of hormones associated with bonding, tolerance, trust, and sensitivity to intimates. This is not even holding their own baby. This is holding any baby. A man tends to his hormones are adjusted. That connection, it's all about connection and love, right? Who can hold a baby and not feel love? You know, that's like, whoa, just look into their eyes. You know, it's, it's amazing. So research shows that hormonal activity in a father is altered during his partner's pregnancy and more so if he's present at the birth. Prolactin, vesopressin, and oxytocin are among the hormones that are found at higher levels in men around the time of birth. And what we all know about the hormones in women at birth, that's all part of most educations and all that. However, the men, they have increased production of prolactin is known to promote bonding, attachment, and caring. Vasopressin causes the man to want to protect his family and be at home rather than on the prowl in search of a mate. And vasopressin is known as a monogamy hormone, commitment. And these are all increased and appropriately so at the time of birth. So, so uh, oxytocin is a hormone produced in men and women during loving contact. And because of this has been named the hormone of love and the feel good home hormone by experts in the field, Michelle O'Donnell, Sheila Kitzinger, and Dr. Sarah Buckley. And Sheila Kitzinger was an English champion in the field of conscious birthing practice. She's no longer with us in a body. It's also a necessary hormone for a mother's body to produce in order to ensure a successful pregnancy, labor, and birth. Since couples are already in the habit of producing oxytocin during intimacy, they can contribute this dimension of their relationship to enhance the mother's labor. And this is assuming they're in a copacetic, compatible, and loving space. I had a midwife come to me once and say, you know, we've got the, I've got this couple I'm working with, and they've broken up. The mother's woman's pregnant. They've broken up, but the father is insisting on being at the birth, but they're at war with each other. And she says, he should be there, right? I said, absolutely not. He has no business in that room if he is not in total support of her process and caring and loving the process. He has no, he can be outside the door. He can be in another state. I don't care. He has no business putting his energy in that room because it's going to influence the outcome. Not his job right now. <clears throat> However, adrenaline can override oxytocin, which is addresses back to the story I just told and block the production of oxytocin in the mother. Adrenaline is typically produced as a result of fear. If anyone, doctor, midwife, doula, mother, father, nurse, anyone in the birthing room is fearful, adrenaline will be communicated across time and space and adversely affect the mother's labor. A man in close loving contact with his child and the mother will have reduced levels of testosterone as well, thereby causing him to be more gentle and relaxed. 
Consequently, father love added, added as an ingredient in the recipe of a mother's labor, mother love can be a useful enhancement for birth. The birth of a child is the ultimate perfection of human love, Grantly Dick Reed. He was one of the originators of bringing fathers into the birthing room. Breastfeeding and dads, this is a favorite topic of mine <laughs> because it's so important and dads have so much influence that it's staggering. <clears throat> so this is a time of breastfeeding where surrender is really, really called for on the part of the father. He, his job is to be in service. It's not his job to input himself into the world of breastfeeding, except as it pertains to supporting the mother in being successful at it. And whether it's through his contribution or her having a consult with somebody else, whatever, it's important that, that those early days are supported to have successful breastfeeding. And it's not about the dad, it's not about giving him a bottle so he can feel like he's included. No way. That's, and, and also research shows that within a week or two, he loses interest. You know, it's like, let me do the bottle so that, you know, of course the bottle spoils the child because the milk comes out so easily. Then going back to the breast is more of a challenge if they've gone to the bottle and trying to do both at the same time rarely works well. So really important. This is an old statistic, but if we can just, this was probably a 10 or 12 year old statistic. Over 90% of mothers will not breastfeed if the father is against it. Take a breath and think about that in our culture. How much power has that gender have to control the opposite gender in this very sensitive time? That's like, oh my God. Fortunately, the vast majority don't insist, but when they do, it's, it's a tragedy for the mother, no matter what she's wanting. If he imposes his will, mother and baby lose out. <clears throat> Harvard Medical School did a randomized controlled trial. <clears throat> they took a group of expectant dads and they put them into two groups. One group got a bog standard two hour prenatal education class. The other group got that same class, except they included 30 minutes on breastfeeding, the benefits of breastfeeding for the mother and the child. Out of that control group, 74% of the mothers whose fathers got the education on breastfeeding, 74% of those mothers breastfed as opposed to 41% in the other control group. That is huge. <laughs> so obviously fathers have a lot to do with breastfeeding. You know, if, and this is if he is informed, if he knows. Now he's had this long relationship with this woman, although He's just met the baby. <laughs> this baby is a stranger of sorts to him. He has not, the baby, mother knows the baby pretty well on certain levels because they've spent nine months together quite intimately. And yet here he is coming into the process and it's like, it, but he doesn't know. Plus, if he knows the benefits for the mother, there are tremendous benefits for the mother breastfeeding, no postnatal or less postnatal depression, better uh, health all along the way and the reproductive system, all sorts of things benefit the mother as well. So if he knows that, he can better identify with the mother than the baby. Yeah, we can tell him, oh yeah, it's, there's, it's not like formula, it's got this, it's got that, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if he knows that his partner is going to be better off as well, then that's a key, that's something he needs to know. So if a father is intimate with his child, especially through skin-to-skin -skin contact, his oxytocin production increases. Elevated oxytocin in the father is recognized as a key component in jump-starting and maintaining his nurturing instincts. Dads get to feel good too. I mean, it's like chocolate, you know, oxytocin, you get with chocolate too, right? It's like you do get to feel good. So loving, caring, loyalty, bonding, protection, attachment, and commitment are potentially enhanced in a new father. Fathers are acquiring tenderness and a sense of belonging from engaging with mothers and babies during pregnancy, birth, and after. This then establishes a more durable foundation for a lifelong loving relationships between family members. So, no, yeah. And a bonus, the life expectancy of the family is enhanced. 
when a man is nurturing, when a man's nurturing instincts and hormones are awakened, we are destined for a future that is different from our past. As a society, we have the responsibility to see to it that our families have the opportunity to fulfill their potential together. Uh, I lived in Hawaii and this is a family that they borrowed the bottom part of our flotation tank as their birthing pool. And they already had, I think, four kids. So the whole family was in on this water birth. And this is a picture, this is on their back porch. <laughs> and so it's, it's not just about the mothers or the doulas or the midwives or the doctors or the fathers or the grandmothers. Or It's a cultural thing. It's even if, I have a, a phrase I use in my book, a bonus father. A bonus father is someone who's not biologically connected to the baby. Same with a bonus mother. It's an aunt, an uncle, a scout leader, a, a whoever. It's somebody that has contact with young people and embraces them with love in various ways. And so, uh, you know, I have a brother that will never have children. He's gay. He's, he's, that's not his thing. However, he gives time and money to several children's charities. He's a bonus father. He's doing his fathering in a way that works in his world. And that is just fabulous. We're all in this thing because it's called one world. <laughs> you know, we are on one planet. So it's about relationships and they're overlapping, inter intersecting worlds. Attachment, bonding, an emotional bond or a tie to someone or something. And we have become a society of things. So it's important that the attachment happens early with someone rather than some things. So just embrace that and give that a little thought. In order for a baby's brain to properly develop, the baby needs secure attachment, securely attached to parent figures. The baby who is not successfully attached will experience distress. The baby who's experienced prolonged or repeated distress or is left to feel abandoned or unsafe will need to defend itself. The baby's brain cannot grow or develop and defend itself at the same time, only one or the other. And these parent figures, it doesn't matter, mother, father, adoption, surrogates, none of that matters. What matters is that attachment, that bonding, that child feeling safe. For successful development, a baby needs two different types of attachment, two different types of human interaction, a secure base and comfort and exploration and excitement as the child grows up. This is my colleague, Elmer Postal, that started the Fathers to Be project with me, with his son, Lucian, who is now maybe 18, 17, something like that. <laughs> I love this picture of them. That's in Kew Gardens in London. <laughs> So when does fathering begin? Chicken or the egg, right? Well, fathering begins really early. It's fathering is a cultural thing. Fathering as well as mothering is a cultural thing. It's like, this is the bottom picture there is myself, my water baby, and then his son. And it, it begins at the beginning. You know, it's it's always there. So all of our messages, I don't care if it's on the evening news in movies that we have or in books or whatever it is, it's always there and it's being communicated and they're taking it in. So I think it's important to understand that we have future fathers all around us in all shapes and sizes. Research shows that if a father's actively involved in their child's lives, children are less likely to have emotional or behavioral problems, have a higher self-esteem and life satisfaction, less likely to commit crimes, have better peer relations, do better in school, they're healthier and they're happier if the father's engaged with them. When men feel welcome, included and confident in their role as a father, they have the potential to embrace their child's spiritual nature. We know in our heart of hearts that there's more to life than the visible world. Just as a mother gives birth to a child's body, so can a father lovingly support the birth of a child's spirit, their essential self, their highest purpose and ideals for their lifetime. It's a friend of mine in Denmark. <laughs> I love my baby and my baby loves me. Love is a reciprocal thing. It, it doesn't happen in a void. It, you know, and do you suppose anything could ever separate these two in their lifetime? You know, <laughs> that is the sweetest picture. So thank you for supporting 
fathers in finding their way in the very feminine world of pregnancy, birth, and breastfeeding. Thank you for supporting father's empowerment during the primal time, which is beneficial for everyone, mothers, fathers, babies, society, and the professionals caring for the family. My father's to be handbook. I welcome you to, uh, it's available on Amazon, although Amazon had a glitch. It may be a day or two for it's there again, but it's on my website, fatherstobe.org. And I'm available for uh, talks, lectures, workshops anywhere in the world. Patrick Hauser at hotmail.com, fatherstobe.org is the website. Thank you for recognizing fathers make a world of difference. Questions? Thank you, Patrick. Wow, so beautiful. <laughs> Mothering, fathering, nurturing can come in so many forms and paths as long as it comes, right? <laughs> Absolutely. We need the it. Baby's not particular. Just give me love. Give me <laughs> That's love. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> if you have any questions for Patrick, we have some minutes left. So please feel free to type them up in the chat. We've got some time with him, and we're so <clears> grateful <throat> that you're here. Patrick and sharing this information with the world, it's so necessary. Also the empathy exercise, if you had an aha moment you'd like to share there, mm -hmm. that's typically pretty valuable. We did have someone quote on that. Let me run back up here in the chat and read it to you. Um, several people are just commenting on the, the phrases that you use. Go ahead and use the F word, they loved that. <laughs> Amy shared, this was such a useful technique, the empathy exercise. Uh, to really feel what the dad might experience. Thank you. I have a new perspective now. Yay. Mm -hmm. And so let's see, I'm back down here. I think we've got to move. Uh, Marsh is asking, do you teach childbirth educators specifically about Absol these? Things? Absolutely. A whole whole day workshops. Yes. There's a whole journey to take. And it's fairly experiential and informational both. Mm -hmm. I've noticed in you know my travels around the world that so many other cultures have clear guidance for fathers and it had to be in birth and around that time frame. And I think it is a big missing piece yeah. of our culture that uh, that they don't know what to do or how to be or yeah. they don't know what they don't know. <laughs> how can you hold them responsible for not knowing what they don't know? You know? <laughs> right. Marsha had a follow-up. She says, Is this when you teach to childhood educators, is it in person or online? And where where is it? you know i haven't done it online yet i haven't shifted to that but it's probably a good idea which it would be easy enough to do i i mean i love the room with full of people um and yes i could let me know i'll i'll meet the occasion whatever it is <laughs> when you teach in person do you travel or is it only in texas oh, no no i travel yeah yeah great i used to when i lived i lived in england for 16 years and so i'd come back to the states and i'd do what i call my father love tour so like I went to Colorado, I did four different cities and I did evening presentations for parents and then whole day workshops for birth professionals. Great. Mark has a question here. He says, thank you, Thomas. As a male, what are the professional roles or certifications for men? Most roles have, of course, a feminine conceptualization or practice. Well, some of the childbirth education uh, organizations do have men who come in and become educators as well as doulas, or as I call them, doodlas. <laughs> and uh, there are there are people, there are men doing that that process. Uh, I, I can't name the organizations, you just need to do a little exploration. But um, yeah, I think it's important to have a couple teaching a childbirth education class is really valuable, which was it one of the organizations that included dads mostly had couples teaching for the longest time. I forget which one it is. So there's not necessarily a specific um, certification just for the males uh, that are doing birth no. facilitation. No, no. Amy says, my husband and I are beginning a foster care journey with babies. Do you imagine the hormones that you spoke of will be in play, even if it's not um, a, a birthing experience? Absolutely. And the skin to skin is that extra edge. Anytime you can become skin to skin with another person, I mean, whether it's a baby or your partner, you know, that that elevates that whole experience. So, yeah, it's it's all about 
caring and loving and being present with another human being. So yeah, and, and especially if you're fostering, then there's kind of an assumption that child's been through something that that wasn't as optimal as it could be. And so there's there's some void to fill in there. So it takes an extra dose, perhaps, of awareness and loving and caring to support that child's development. Mm -hmm. Francois asks, when do you think that men should start being prepared for fatherhood? And what would be the main aspects of that education? When they're a child. <laughs> I had a, a, an organization in England, a school, bought, I mean, something like 176 copies of my book. I forget the exact number. And this was for their, uh, I think it was eighth graders, ninth graders, something like that. They gave one to everybody in that class that's where we ought to start, you know? I mean, to, to really, you know, what I would call nuts and bolts to really get to an understanding. In my book, <clears throat> there's nothing in my book about changing diapers. <laughs> it's about who we are and how we got to be this way. You know, it's about the essence of this presentation. It's the foundation of pre and perinatal psychology. It's, it's all about, you know, becoming present, you know, about being aware and how to, you know, and things like, how was I fathered? How, how, guess what that's a default setting unless you you've deleted that gone through a process because what can happen is a man who however he was fathered that's the default setting how he was fathered right so that means he's got two choices or two non-choices really he reacts and and he does it just the way his father did oh, stern this that uh, or even loving whatever way it is or he can swing the pendulum the other way I'm not going to do it like he did it. I'm going to do it this way, blah, blah, blah. But actually, neither of those are choices. Those are a reaction mode to how it was done to you. Instead, if you take some exercise in self-awareness, you come back to the middle and you go, okay, now this is me. This is my family. This is my children. How do I want to be in this relationship? So yeah, start at the beginning, you know, really engage in it and reading and taking classes and talking with other guys that are dads helps a lot because they've been through it, been there, done that, you know. Mm -hmm. We need conscious curriculum for our young men and women in, in, in all of these aspects <clears throat> for, for healthy sex education and, and birthing education. Yeah, when Elmer and I started this process, we designed a two and a half day course. We thought we'd get a, since nobody had ever offered anything before, we thought, hey, we're going to have a three day workshop. We're going to take guys right through it, A to Z, you know? Well, we tried and tried and tried and tried. Couldn't get a quorum. We couldn't find, how do you find a pregnant guy, right? An expected dad. How do you find him, right? Well, ultimately, what happened is a friend of ours who was a, a childbirth educator, and she had a room in her house that she dedicated to do her child education classes, childbirth education. And it, she did it in the form of couples. And so she said, so we said, hey, how about? just sending some guys over, you know? So at the end of the class on a Thursday night or something, she said to all the men in the room, you're welcome to come back here on Saturday. There's a free course for expectant dads. And they said, what's that? She goes, well, I don't actually know. I haven't been to one, but I know these two guys that are doing it and they're right on, they're, they're great. So just come and see what happens. Six guys showed up. It was fabulous. And that was our first opportunity to actually, we had, we had six guys for like two hours and it was free. You know, but it was like, we got to get our feet in the water, you know, and it was just amazing. They just, and we just, we just took them on a journey. I did exit interviews with them afterwards and four, let's see, there were six, seven, five out of the six said, uh, if I had known in advance what we were going to do, I never would have showed up if it was on the brochure, so to speak. Hmm. However, six out of six said, I am so grateful that I came. I got so much out of that two hours, you know, because so we had to kind of sneak in the back door, you know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mark wants to know if you still happen to have that curriculum for potential export back into the UK. That's where he's at. <laughs> That's proprietary. <laughs> we can talk <laughs> contact me. <laughs> yes, yes. Patrick Hauser at hotmail.com. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Patrick, for sharing your wisdom and your experiences Absolutely. with all of us today. Thank you, so, Catherine, for your dedication and commitment to the work. Oh, thank you. So come back next Monday and join us again. We'll return to the Great Mother with Dr. Issa Gucciardi.
and she'll share a sacred feminine perspective of birth and initiations. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> until then, we love you all. And feel free to unmute yourself to offer your blessings. Thank you so much. You're inspiring. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, all the way from France. Hey, Francois. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Beautiful.